So hi everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that this lecture will be in English. I don't spe speak Ukrainian and Russian, so sorry about that. I hope you will like uh, that you're okay with it. So my name is Alexander. I come from the company called uh, Nordus, and I'm just curious, like if you can just raise hands if you are familiar with Nordus or or Top Eleven. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll talk about Nordus just in a second. First of all. Um, I'm a game producer at this company, and as a producer, I'm responsible that the team delivers whatever we need to deliver in order to uh, move our business forward. And as part of that, uh, I'm responsible for the team, because the team is the, is, is the one that delivers the product. And today, I will share with you how we, at Top11 and at Nordius, uh, create teams and how we uh, are trying to uh, get them to the point where we consider them high performing. So you'll hear our story uh, that was happening uh, in the last two years. And uh, the story is actually about these guys. Uh, this is my team. Uh, we called ourselves uh, the squad. We are working actually on the fo football game. Top 11 does the name uh, of the team. And I'm really proud of these guys. They're really smart. They're beautiful. So we are a great team. Uh, before I get to the actual story, I just want to say a few words about Nordius itself. So Nordius is a gaming company uh, that is uh, based in Belgrade, Serbia, in uh, south, southeastern uh, Europe. And we have offices in London and Dublin as well. So we are a truly international company. We also have you know, a couple of people from U U uh, Ukraine there. Uh, and uh, we are mo most known for our football management game called Top 11. This is one of the best uh, football managers games for mobile devices. And this is our only game for now. It's our flagship product, but uh, it will not be that like for long because we are soft launching our new game called Spell Souls, Duel of Legends in, I think, two weeks. So keep in mind for that. I think it will be an amazing game. Um, anyway, Nordius's mission is basically to make a difference on three fronts. So the first uh, front is we want to make a difference in our players' li uh, lives, users' lives, by providing them amazing gaming experiences through our games. The second thing where we would like to make a difference is in our people's lives, in employees' lives, by uh, making them empowered to make impact on, on the community and on the, our players. And the third thing where we make impact is the community itself. So we are really socially responsible and we like to give back to various uh, state systems and institutions like healthcare, government, uh, education, and so on. Okay, so uh, I need to start the story with Top 11 because the team that I'm talking about today is working on, on this game. So Top 11, as I said, is a football management game. For mobile devices, it's a six-year-old game. It was developed in 2010 initially for, for Facebook platform, and then we uh, transitioned to mobile along the way. Uh, currently, Top 11, it, it has 150 million registered users, which is a lot. And um, we are in the uh, top charts in the countries where football is very popular. But since it's a six, more than six-year-old game, it wasn't like that along the journey of Top 11, of course. Every game has its ups and downs, and Top 11 uh, reached its peak in 2013 uh, and 2014 when Facebook was really strong back then. And uh, suddenly we started losing users, and with users, of course, revenues. Um, why? Well, market slowly transitions from Facebook to, to, to mobile, from social gaming on, on social networks to mobiles, and we didn't really follow through that. And uh, what happened then, we decided, okay, uh, Top 11 was initially designed for Facebook. Their core, its core systems are made for Facebook, not for mobile devices. The user experience was not there. And we actually decided to uh, redesign the game. So we made a decision to redesign it. Uh, what we wanted to do actually to introduce the like first uh, mobile first user experience to the game. We wanted to introduce more modern look and feel to the game. And we actually wanted, on the production side, to reduce number of technologies that we were using. So before this update that, was, that happened in January 2015, we had uh, three teams working on the, uh, on the front end. You have, we had Android team, we had uh, iOS team, we had Flash team. So three teams working on the same things. 
And we wanted to change that and to have one cross-functional team. And we introduced Unity, so we rewrite that everything from scratch in Unity, which allows uh, cross-platform builds. So we formed a task force to rewrite everything that we already had into, into the game. Not to add new features, not to add new stuff, just to rewrite everything we already had on the front-end side. But we knew that those were not the people who are supposed to lead the further development of the product. They were the best people in the Nordius in terms of uh, capability and engineering skills, but they were not passionate about top 11 football and so on. We just put them there to rewrite everything in the new technology to make the engine work and so on. And as I said, we knew that we needed a new group of people, a new team to lead further development of the product. So uh, we started thinking how we should do it. And we started uh, forming the team. And the first phase of uh, forming the team is formation phase or uh, honeymoon. Why honeymoon? Well, because it's new for everyone. It's interesting. It's uh, you know exciting for everyone. And it also, this phase lasts very shortly. And um, Branko, CEO of Nordius, and myself um, set out to form this team. And we had a vision how, uh, what team we would like to create. So we approach this problem by setting principles which we will use to select people in the team. And we had three principles. The first one was passion. We really wanted people who are passionate about either of the next three things. The first thing was uh, top 11 as a game itself. We had uh, lots of people that are passionate about top 11 in the company. The second thing was um, a passion about football. We wanted people who liked football and uh, who uh, are basically our target audience. And we also wanted people who uh, were passionate about the technology behind Top 11. Top 11 has an, ama has an amazing technology, especially on the back-end side, and there were people who are just wanted to work on that as well. So that, that was the first principle, passion. The second principle that we used to create a team was desire. So desire to work on Top 11. We didn't want to push people uh, on top of line and said, okay, you now need to work here because we need you to. No, we, we invited people to join us and we got a pretty big response. So the desire to work on top of line was our second principle. And the third principle was uh, history, actually the proven track record uh, of people that they work well together before. So people who worked uh, before, um, we wanted them in the team. And this one was really hard to do because we didn't have that many people uh, in the company that worked together, but okay, we, we wanted to maximize that uh, effect. And with, with these principles in mind, these two principle, uh, three principles, we actually set out and selected around 12 people that will work on the product, and several more joined us uh, during the next few months. And we had the front-end developers, back-end developers, uh, QA engineers, artists, uh, you know, Scrum Master, Product Owner, all that stuff. It was a, crew, a true uh, cross-functional team. And Nordus works like that. So we only have cross-functional teams. We don't have silos. We don't have functional teams like server team, test team, and so on. We have only one team, and they work all together on, on uh, introducing new features and updates and improving the game. So um, when you assemble your team, when you gather all those people, what, what is the next step for you? Well, well, what we did first is actually we sat down with people and we started to talk with them a lot. Why we did this? Because we wanted to align them on what was our goal, what is our mission, what is our true north, where we want to go. And I just want to tell you that there is no like a magic wand or a bullet that you can use to align people. One presentation is not going to cut it. One uh, discussion is not going to cut it. You need to do that all the time throughout the, the years, throughout the time that you're with the team. You need to constantly talk with the team and you need to uh, show them uh, how, for example, top 11 will, will look like in one year from now, in two years from now, in five years from now, how the team will look like, like what values we're gonna uh, share together. Because in my opinion, the team is actually a group of people that share the same values and uh, they have the same objective. And you need to sit down with them and talk them throughout your journey all, all day long. So that's one thing that we did. We shared, the, we shared with them our ideas and vision of what we want to achieve. The 
another thing that you can that you should do actually when you are creating the team from the beginning is uh, organize some team building activities that help team just assemble themselves and to create uh, connections between team members early on because that will help you uh, after in later stages of team development which you will hear about a bit later um, there are a lot of exercises that you can use to bond the team to gel them together the one that really uh, the one that I really like and basically always use is market of skills you will have, you will have links in the end so you can uh, take uh, take a photo but for now this is like my favorite exercise and really helps you uh, make initial connection between team members so after that after this uh, people will know more about uh, about themselves uh, about each other actually they will know what their their motivations are what they know what they want to learn and so on and that and they can help each other uh, be better so this one is 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 really good so another uh, exercise that you can do for example there is uh, one that I really like called competency matri matrix you will align the team regarding uh, competencies in the team or um, responsibility matrix where you are aligning the team about who is responsible for what in the team so those kind of exercises, I exercises are really good for aligning the team earlier so we're done with the forming and soon after people start working together on real problems all sort of differences arise so for example uh, then you then you will get conflicts between people when they start working on actual problems you will see the differences in for example working habits in personalities and so on and you need to deal with it and this one this phase is actually uh, the most dangerous one because many teams do not uh, get out of this phase at all and the performance of the team is the lowest at, at this point uh, I will share, share with you the two problems that we had uh, that were the most prominent ones and the hardest ones. The first one that we had is actually these differences in working styles. So we'll have people from different backgrounds, different experience. They worked in other teams before, in other companies before, and uh, they have different habits of doing things. And those can get, uh, can get into a conflict. And uh, for example, uh, someone might be used to come to work at 8, someone at 10, but they are mutually dependent, so they are blocking each other, then uh, people are not happy with that, or they can have like different engineering practice, practices, how, like how we are doing code reviews, and so on. And to solve this, uh, we actually, uh, you actually need to set some rules or hard processes in place just to make people uh, work um, the same way at least for some time and I know that some of you can say okay but processes are overheads people don't like processes they don't like rules yes but if not done right they can be an overhead that can they can be a problem but if done right processes can help you actually create a new team culture new habits and then people start working together and if you have culture then process you can remove processes and uh, you will not need them anymore people will just work together as one uh, one exercise that goes uh, well with this is called team agreements. You, you also have a link in the end. You basically sit down with the team, you list all your, your, all your problems, and then you make some agreements together. Like three to four uh, team agreements, not more, because if you have more than that, that would be too many rules, and people do not like rules. But the good thing is, after some time, they become, uh, become habits, and then when they're habits, you can create new ones and you can say, okay, this is not a rule, this is just the way you're doing things, and so on. So to sum up, to solve these differences in uh, work styles of people that are coming from different backgrounds, you, you need to set some new rules together, of course, with the team uh, to align them on how we are doing things from now on. And the second issue that we had, um, and the hardest one, was uh, these um, personality conflicts. Now you might get people in the team who are not going, uh, they're, not, they're, not work well, they're not going well together. Uh, there is conflict between them somehow in their personalities. So we have this guy who was uh, not working well with uh, others in the team, including myself. We kind of pushed him into the team and we broke our second principle for creating the team, if you remember, and because we needed his capability. And because of the conflict, we tried to work it out by having uh, 
really tough conversations with them on one-on-ones, on team retrospectives or post-mortems and so on, but it didn't work in the long run. So uh, what they actually did then, I, was, uh, I started looking for other opportunities for that person in the company to, to uh, move him to the other team. And I found one and uh, we transferred him to the team. And you know what happened with my team? They actually uh, were, you know, they thrilled afterwards. You know, they thrived really faster because there was no more negative energy that was coming out from this conflict between people. You know, there, if you don't have negative energy in the team, people will thrive. And his capability was not the problem because people from the team actually figured, okay, we can uh, go an extra mile, we can learn that stuff and start working and cover that as well. So it actually worked out. But in the end, if you, don't, if you can't find an opportunity for uh, people like this in the company, then in my opinion, it's better to let go or even to fire them. Uh, because this negative energy, in my opinion, is the singlest and is the uh, single most, uh, is the biggest actual inhibitor of uh, team development and uh, organizational development. And you don't want people who will spread negative energy in the team, even though they are capable. It will be a win win situation in the end for both of them, for both of you, for the company and for the team. So, uh, the third phase after we resolved all these major issues, uh, then com comes the forming phase, uh, norming phase, sorry. Um, and uh, here, okay, we've uh, set up some processes, the culture is taking place, people are working together well enough. Uh, and so far I was uh, solely responsible for these changes to happen. And I didn't like this because this approach wasn't scalable enough. I wanted for changes to come from uh, all sides. So no, not only, top down from me, but also bottom up, sideways, you name it. And I was, uh, I, I stumbled upon this book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a great one, I really recommend you to read it, which gives you a model of, uh, that has five dysfunctions that every team can have. And uh, what they did actually, I sat down with the team, we went through this model, they now understand what can go wrong uh, in the team. And when they understand, they can actually uh, start working on, on changing stuff. Uh, I will just briefly go through them because I don't have enough time, but I, I really encourage you to read the book. So the first dysfunction is absence of trust. If you don't have trust, you will not have team at all. So that is like the foundation of every team. And the second one, if you don't have trust, uh, then maybe you, don't, uh, you will not have conflict. And conflict is good if it's productive. If it's only focused on uh, ideas and, high, and concepts, then it's good because out of that you can innovate. But if, if, it's, if the conflict is uh, personality focused, then you have a problem and you need to react. Um, the third dysfunction is lack of commitment. So uh, here you really need to hear people what they're saying to you. You need to hear their opinions. You need to take their ideas into account. And um, uh, if you hear them, they will commit on the decision. But if you don't hear them, they will not commit. And thus, they will not do their best. And you really want people to commit on, on all sorts of decisions and agreements. For this function is avoidance of accountability. So if people are not committed, they will in the end say, OK, I was not for that idea anyway, so it's not really my fault. I don't have accountability for that. And this is, this is bad, it's not teamwork. And in the end, the fifth and ultimate dysfunction is in attention to results, which means you will have people that are maybe uh, focused only on themselves and they put their own interest in front of the teams and company's interest, which is really bad. And then you will know that you have a real problem. Uh, the book comes with a test. You can do the test with your team. You will uh, know what you have, what symptoms, and uh, you can actually change that because there are ways to change these things and to improve them. So after this uh, norming phase, uh, the team finally came to the point where we wanted it to be uh, after a year of working together. So the performing phase. Uh, we had everything in place and we were really happy with the output that we're getting. So how do we know? Uh, well, whatever you do, you need, to, you need to measure it. You need to set some KPIs in place, you need to set some measures in place, otherwise you will not know whether you're improving or not. 
So the few things that we measured was, for example, something in the uh, like uh, sprint to sprint iteration to iteration basis. It's team velocity, so the out the output of the team per iteration, then the release frequency, the amount of work that goes into the live product uh, that impacts the users in meaningful ways, not just bug fixes and uh, smaller improvements. And my favorite, it's more subjective, but you can just see that people in the team are happy. So when you, when you uh, see the smiles on their face, when you see that they're joking, that they're, like, they're, that they're friends, then you know that you did a pretty good job with the, with the team. But again, if you don't have results, uh, this maybe doesn't matter. Uh, so what is next for us? Uh, even though we came to the point where we wanted to get, uh, year and a half ago, uh, there is still more room for improvement and uh, we think that we can be even more productive. And what we want to try and do is to scale what we have right now. Um, actually, the people grew from initial 12 people, now we have 26 people on top 11 that are working and we want to introduce more. And uh, you really need to scale carefully and in the right way. And what we're actually trying to do right now into is to um, introduce feature teams, like in, in, in Agile, Agile concept, feature, feature teams. And there is this framework called uh, uh, Scaled Agile Framework that really helps you introduce all, all Agile, Agile practices and have multiple teams working on the same product without any major problems. And uh, we really want to keep this uh, team spirit and team bonds and everything that we created along the way. And this concept I call, I mean, there is a book called Team of Teams, again, great read. Uh, you have multiple teams, but all people in those teams are, are feeling as part of one bigger team. And they're all empowered to do things, to change things, to impact things. And if you give them enough, enough context, they can do it. And if you empower them to do it, you will get results. Uh, and if there is one thing I would like to go home with is that you need to know that a team is like a plant. So its growth depends on how you nurture it. So how much time you spend uh, in creating the team and helping them um, overcome their issues. Um, you as a manager is responsible for that and you need to put a lot of time in dealing with uh, those issues, not just project management, product stuff. You need to work with people, you need to work with, uh, with teams. So that's all that I had for you uh, today. I don't think we have time for questions, but you can find me here. We can go outside and, and talk. And this is a slide for, uh, for references if you want to take uh, pictures. Thank you.